Hello everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Got this little cotton ball mic thing here, so you should be able to hear me well, no matter where my head is. I saw um, one of these Japanese teachers that I watch online. She had one of these and I thought it was pretty cool. So in the last video, I talked about this 486 computer that just shocked me. It was really staticky. And we built this last week. Still performing nicely. The monitor is still working. Uh, you kind of have to tap it a little bit. It's kind of green. And now it's back to the right color. And we can see the nice honeycomb pattern. Uh, but it's been operating fine. I try not to use it that much. I, I mainly do uh, programming on another, you know, modern PC using DOSBox, running Win Windows 3.1, which if you haven't ever seen this, this is Windows 3.1. Um, it's quite different than, you know, Windows, I almost said Windows 98. Well, it is. Uh, what is the Windows? We are uh, 11. <laughs> I can't remember. What are we on? 10, 10 and 11. Those are the new ones. Can't even remember even though I use them daily for work. So it's quite different, simple, you know, did not, it still has crashes, but you know, it's a lot simpler. I, I miss some of the features that I, I get on a modern computer, but I can get by with programming on it was, I, you know, I got my old tools on here, like open Wattcom is a old C sharp, uh, C, C, C sharp C compiler. And yeah, in case you don't even know what a 486 computer is, because you might have not even seen this one or, you know, this new, this is like a new thing. Um, give you a little rundown, you know, on, on what the 480, 486 is. So basically 486 was really popular back, you know, in the 1990s. Think of it as like a computer that could first run Doom smoothly if you ever saw the first Doom game. Which actually I think I have installed on here, so I'll load it up and we can see some of it. And this computer is, you know, like probably like a thousand times less powerful than what you can get today. But when these 486 computers came out, they were so powerful that they could finally start rendering 3D graphics and really um, produce visually stunning games. And it was a really big breakthrough to have this much power. And the, the AMD CPU, the AMD 486 DX2 120 megahertz, CPU uh, in this computer has a floating point unit. It can handle floating point operations fast. And if you don't know what a floating point number is, that says a, a number that has a decimal point in it. So 1.5, 10.6, 100.2, you know, floating point numbers like that. That's usually pretty slow. For computers to handle that and when they introduced an fpu on inside of the the cpu it could you know allow for more accurate you know line drawing and richer graphics because of the precision you know of allowing floating points to actually be um, okay to use and not just totally kill your performance because they would just bog down the cpu with too many instruction cycles to figure out you know if you're adding dividing multiplying uh, there were tricks around that, which we'll, I'm sure, explore later on this channel. You know, like fixed point math was a way to still do floating point calculations, but only using integers. And an integer, just to review, is a number with no floating point. So one, two, three, four, five, you know, integers. So that's what a 486 is. And this is, a, uh, of course, it's a restored one, refurbished with Windows 3.1, which is really a shell for MS DOS, and I um, got work done on the ray tracer, which um, it's this book, this book, and it's uh, it's been a it's been a fun read going through computer graphics from scratch, and I finished the first few chapters, and we'll go ahead and load it up on the screen here. And I'll actually only have the source code, so we'll get to compile it and then run it. Okay, now that I've got the camera a bit closer to the CRT monitor, I am going to sit in a weird position here to try to get close enough. 
to show you how I'm going to compile this. So I, I have a, the code on a compact flash disk and we're going to use the open Wacom compiler with this awesome intro screen of the saw cutting the executable in half. I am going to actually, and I don't even know if I created a project yet. Actually I do. Okay. So here's, here's the project that I have set up. This is a, like a very old code editor and this is the old code here. Actually, I'll go ahead and show you what it looked like about a week ago. And whoa, look at that. Ooh, well, that was a weird version there. I'm not sure what's wrong with the, it's probably messing around the color. That's actually supposed to be yellow or actually red. That's supposed to be green and blue. I think I was doing something kind of screwy on this. <laughs> this was code has been sitting out here for a little bit, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go get the code the newer code off the compact flash disk. Trying to remember, okay, file manager. Let's see. On my D drive and move let me move it. Or no, let me just copy it. Okay, this looks like the new code with ambient, point light, directional lights. And I'm gonna go back to the build tool and we're gonna compile this new code. And I hope it does compile. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the last version that I've, the latest one I've been working on. And look at that. As it slowly builds. That looks cool. Let me, let me adjust this a little bit. It gets a little, uh, there we go. There's Kali gonna cause a problem. There's the three spheres and actually there's a four sphere, this big yellow one. And you get to see, oh, check that out. It's like looking at, looking at Toy Story. Hey, Callie, move the tail. Okay, so there's the spheres and you can see there's, there's three different lights in here. There's a directional light, there's a point light, and there's an ambient light. So all of these three lights combine, you can see the, the specular point. You know, it's a very, it's kind of represents a very shiny surface. You got some nice, crisp shadow in here. You can see the, kind of like the sun behind us, you know, and of course in this scene, you could totally rotate the camera and program it, you know, to move it any way you'd like. So a ray tracer creates a realistic 3D image by simulating how light rays bounce around a scene. For each pixel on the screen, it shoots an imaginary ray into the 3D world and figures out what color that pixel should be based on what the ray hits and how light would interact with it. It's like tracing the path light would be, would, would be taking, but backwards from your eye to the light source. Man, this, so that's, that's what a ray tracer is. It, it just, every pixel you're, you're, you know, projecting a ray and, and seeing for every little pixel, you're putting a ray in there and say, okay, am I hitting something? Am I hitting something? when it does hit something, it's like, oh, I hit, okay, what's, what did I hit? Then you have to calculate what's the color. Uh, is it casting a shadow? Um, is it being, how is it being lit? And there's three lights in these scenes and this monitor is really struggling. There's three lights in these scenes. So, uh, look. And so once it's done combining all the lights together, that's the image you get where you can see the shadows and the specular. That's the specular when you can see the light source and you can change, of course, the materials of these spheres. You can make them shinier or less shinier or less reflective or, you know, just completely matte and just, uh, you know, completely diffuse the color. So getting to see, you know, what a ray tracer can produce, you can have the fun of doing this yourself with the book that I, I mentioned earlier and you could, program it on any device, any, any programming language. It's all just in pseudocode. So you can put it into Python, JavaScript, whatever, you know, you, you prefer, and you can display it on any screen. As long as you have a screen that you can attach to and you can put pixels onto it, calculator screen, or even a pregnancy tester screen, whatever you prefer. I actually, I'm struggling with the next part, which is the reflections. 
um, because I don't have many colors to work with. I only have 256 colors because we're in mode 13H. You unfortunately don't have that anymore today since computers have gotten so complex. Multitasking going on, uh, you know, the, the, the operating system vendors have to be careful that programs just can't willy nilly touch any kind of memory on your computer and just cause it to, you know, blue screen death or just brick itself. And this, and, the, and these colors right here, I had, to, I had to calculate a careful palette that was optimized for just these colors. So if you had different color spheres, I would have to create a different palette. So I was, I was, I was careful in how I constructed my 256 colors to make sure I got the, the best shading, but the reflections, is just too hard. Cause when you start having to blend the different colors together, it's a tremendous amount of other colors and just becomes quite difficult. It's possible, but it's not, not something I really want to take on. I think I'm really happy with this. So I'm glad I got to tell you like what a ray tracer is, what a 486 computer is, you know, what, a cat is hopefully and i believe that's that's all i have to show today um, i'm going to be working in the next part of the book where they go over a rasterizer it's kind of the opposite of a ray tracer and i'll have this i have the code on my github which i'll put a link in the description and you can check out my github and the book also has uh, examples online which are written in javascript so you can look at the javascript code which they could be pretty helpful so okay so next time i'll probably be talking about a rasterizer which is my really favorite thing and i will give an update eventually on when i have something to show it'll be back on this computer hopefully it's still working and i don't have to buy another monitor okay well that's it thanks